long uh, time friend of the Graduate Institute, <laughs> whom I always have a great pleasure to see among us. So let me um, introduce uh, Ambassador Valentin Zellweger, the permanent representative of uh, Switzerland to the United Nations office at Geneva for his opening remarks. Thank you. Merci, Philippe. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and to open this uh, important and timely discussion. My special thanks go to the organizers of the event for having gathered also throughout the past years several important stakeholders in a series of meetings in Vienna, in Geneva, and in New York. These meetings have broadened and deepened the debate on the issue that is widely known today as the world drug problem. Most of all, they have helped us creating a common ground in understanding the world drug problem in a broader context. Almost three years have passed since the UN General Assembly special session on drugs, the so-called ANGAS, debated in New York on various aspects of drug policies. The ANGAS was a crucial step in shifting drug policy towards a greater focus on health and human rights. Key global actors such as WHO, UNAIDS, the Human Rights Council and others, as well as civil society, all greatly contributed to this debate. We are delight uh, delighted to observe that this new direction appears now to be an integral part of all reflections in this area. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, has highlighted this new approach most notably during his speech at the opening of the 37th session of the Human Rights Council almost a year ago here in Geneva. He said that, and I quote, outdated law enforcement only approaches to drug control have fueled violence and human rights abuses, and they have failed to decrease illicit drug use and supply. I think many of us would wholeheartedly agree with him in saying this. I would also like to underscore that an open and constructive dialogue on drug policy has taken place since the Angas. I think, for example, of the series of intercessional meetings organized and facilitated by the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. These meetings helped member states to present and compare the different approaches and measures already undertaken with a view to applying the practical recommendations set forth in the ANGAS outcome document. To add another positive note, let me highlight the creation of an expert working group by UNODC in Vienna, tasked with improving the collection of statistical data on illicit drugs. Such initiatives, as well as all efforts to improve the quality of data on drugs and the definition of relevant human development indicators should be welcomed. Indeed, only reliable and comparable data on all dimensions concerning the world drug problem can ensure that effective policies are put in place. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, the interconnected nature of the world drug problem brings us naturally here to Geneva, to international Geneva. Geneva is one of the fo foremost centers of global governance and inter alia home to the health and human rights constituencies. With its focus on cross-sectoral and cross-institutional cooperation, Geneva is well placed 
to develop solutions to the multi-dimensional challenges we are faced today. Geneva has the ability to bring actors together across institutional and issue boundaries. But of course, Vienna plays the central role in dealing with the world drug problem. UNODC is the main UN center of competence for drug policy and the Vienna-based Commission on Narcotic Drugs is the policy-making body with prime responsibility for drug control matters. However, a multifaceted global problem such as the world drug problem must also be addressed through comprehensive strategies based on a multi-stakeholder approach. This is where Geneva, as well as other UN location, but mainly Geneva, come into play. Switzerland as host and as a member state is pleased to share with the international community its experience, its own experience in the field of uh, drug policies. Many of you will remember the pictures of the so-called ne needle park in Zurich, which went around the world in the 80s and 90s of the last century. An open drug scene with thousands of drug users in the worst conditions showed that the Swiss drug policies, based merely on repression at that time, had come to a dead end. In reaction, the Swiss government decided to take a new, four-pronged approach that combines prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and law enforcement. This more liberal approach led to the disappearance of open drug scenes in our country. But more importantly, we also experienced a decline in AIDS-related death among drug users, a decline in the number of HIV infections, a decline in the number of drug-related death, and an improvement in public safety and security. These new policies marked the beginning of a new era whereby drug addiction was seen as an illness and therefore drug users were seen as patients and no longer as delinquents or criminals. At the very heart of the change in Switzerland's drug policy back in the 90s and a driving force behind it was then Swiss Health Minister Ruth Dreyfus. And I'm very proud and honored to note that Ruth Dreyfus this evening is among us here, and we will have the privilege of hearing her later. And of course, you couldn't get a better source for information about this uh, uh, sea change in the Swiss approach than we will have here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we firmly believe that a, an inclusive approach should continue guiding us for the forthcoming ministerial debate of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs when states will take stock of the commitments made in 2009 and discuss how to move ahead. This is why it is essential to continue the open and constructive dialogue between states the various UN entities concerned with the different aspects of the global drug problem, the academic sector and civil society. Let me conclude by quoting former Deputy Secretary General uh, Jan Eliasson in his opening remarks to the ANGAS in 2016. The challenges posed, he said, by the world drug problem require a global response that is simultaneously effective, compassionate, and humane. We need a mobilization of efforts and good forces on this basis and in this spirit. His words have in no way lost their validity. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to an inspiring and rich evening discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Selweger, for your words. I think uh, 
we are all inspired to have such a debate here, knowing, as you mentioned, that Geneva is a very place to have this kind of debate, given the multi-dimensional aspect of the drug policy. So I think uh, that's a very place, and given also the special experience of the four pillar poly drug policy in Switzerland. So just to start with, let me just mention two, uh, two aspects of a report that will be detailed by Anne Fordham, Executive Director of the International Drug Policy Consortium, a network of 180 uh, NGOs. Just two words, she's gonna detail that, she's gonna explain that at length, but there were, between 2009 and 2016, there's been a 31% increase in the overall number of people who use drugs and there's also been an increase of 125% in, uh, in opium pop, poppy cultivation and 30% in coca cultivation. With those figures, I'm very, very excited to, to have this panel with very distinguished uh, experts on, on the drug policies, starting with Ellen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, former administrator of the United Nations Development Program, and member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Uh, she's going to talk about the very uh, challenges uh, of international drug control and about the, the sustainable development goals, which are very much linked to, 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 to the whole uh, health-related issues linked to, to the drug policies. Uh, on the panel, we also have uh, uh, Ms. Mariangela Simao. Uh, she is the Assistant Director General of uh, the World Health Organization, and she's going to talk about all health-related issues linked to drug policies. Uh, we, on the panel, we also have, as you said, Anne Fordham. She's going to present the what we call, what they call the shadow report. That's a basically a report about the action plan of the UN, the 10 year old, 10 year uh, UN plan that has never been assessed. And all those NGOs belonging to this consortium have decided to come up with a scientific report called uh, the shadow report. She's gonna tell us everything about that and all the takeaways from this report. And we also have on the panel uh, Mr. Uh, Mohamed Mahmoud Old Mohamedou, a professor here at the Graduate Institute, and he's going to talk about uh, uh, drug policy from a West African perspective. Mr. Mohamedou uh, is uh, on, uh, on the board of a commission on drugs in West Africa, and he's going to talk about the very experience there. And then we also have the pleasure to welcome uh, um, Anya Sarang. She's, uh, she's from the Rilkoff Foundation, and she's going to come up with a community perspective, and she's, she's going to explain through a very concrete example the impact of drug policies in Russia, for example, but no, no, not only. So I, I, with that, I'm over. I'm going to hand the floor immediately to Helen Clark to, to start the, the conversation about this, uh, what we call now the lost decade uh, in the global war on drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you to the Graduate Institute uh, for hosting this very important discussion uh, coming before the ministerial segment of the Commission on Narcotics Drugs meeting coming up in Vienna in just uh, the next uh, few weeks. Can I acknowledge uh, all members of the diplomatic community here, uh, UN agencies, civil society, uh, media, and uh, thank you for coming because it is, has, has already been stressed, so important that the Geneva community is involved in the drug policy discussions. Here in Geneva, we have the world's greatest concentration of headquarters of UN and civil society and other agencies across health, across human rights, across the humanitarian sector. And these sectors need to have a voice in global health policy debate. And I'm very pleased that the uh, Global Commission on Drug Policy, led by Madam Dreyfus, who is with us tonight, has been working with other friends in this community to facilitate uh, the Geneva-Vienna dialogue so that Geneva does get a voice uh, in what is uh, happening. So, 
to recap, for the past half century, uh, global drug control policy uh, has been based on the general principle of elimination of the production, uh, trade in, and the use of any illegal uh, psychoactive of substance. And that policy has been advanced through fierce law enforcement and in parts of the world, uh, militarization. Actually, uh, from that has come what the UN Office on Drugs and Crime itself has described as a range of, quote, unintended consequences. Although maybe if people had reflected a little, they wouldn't uh, have seen, been seen as so surprising. But those consequences include uh, creating the most profitable, illegal market for goods in the world, that is the, uh, the market in, in drugs. It has had the consequence of mass incarceration around the world. It has contributed to health epidemics across uh, HIV, uh, hepatitis and TB. Uh, it has um, uh, contributed to so many deaths uh, through overdoses. And of course, uh, it has also contributed to a lack of access uh, to effective uh, medicines, uh, which would benefit uh, many of the world's people seeking uh, relief from pain and other uh, treatments. Now, the impact uh, of these punitive policies mandated by the UN conventions has been borne uh, by the world's poorest and most marginalised people, the people we are exhorted uh, in the uh, sustainable development agenda not to leave behind but they are left behind as a result of uh, these uh, policies. So, uh, the member states could change course uh, with global uh, drug policy. Uh, they could change course unilaterally, as has been seen most recently in, uh, at a nation state level in Canada and in Uruguay with legalization and regulation of cannabis. And when member states meet in Vienna at the ministerial segment in a few weeks' time, uh, they could take a realistic review of uh, the 2009 political declaration and plan of action on drugs. Uh, it is actually extremely unfortunate that there has been no official review or evaluation of that decade to inform the member state deliberations. You know, in the eight years I was at UNDP, we were expected to evaluate everything and report on impact. But there has been no official evaluation of the decade on drugs. Now, thank heaven for civil society and for this report, which is a very thorough report uh, produced by the International Drug Policy uh, Consortium. And I was uh, very pleased to contribute uh, a forward uh, to it. I think its findings are quite compelling that we have indeed had a lost decade on drug uh, policy. Now, let's remember that the political declaration of 2009 set this year, the end of the decade, 2019, as, quote, the target date for states to eliminate or reduce significantly and measurably illicit cultivation, production, trafficking, and use of internationally controlled substances. In short, as you've already heard, this has not happened, not remotely happened. Actually, a number of the trends have gone completely the other way. Uh, as, for example, with opium production, up 130% in the last decade. Coca, up 34%. Drug use, as we heard, up 31%. Drug-related deaths have soared, uh, estimated in 2015 alone to be 450,000 deaths. And then this mass incarceration that I spoke of before, where one in every five of the world's 10 million prisoners uh, are there mostly for minor and non-violent possession uh, type offences. Drug violence, needless to say, has spiralled in this uh, context and if we just take Mexico uh, alone, uh, its uh, a period of dedication to the war on drugs, quote unquote, has seen something like a quarter of a million deaths, uh, uh, 30,000 or so disappeared people, 
uh, and hundreds of thousands of internally displaced persons. So any honest evaluation, like the Civil Society report, would have to draw out uh, these uh, consequences. Uh, this has been a decade of failure, and it's time to learn from that. Uh, it's also fair to say that this failure is a very big barrier in the way of achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, not least, and we could take almost any goal and look at uh, the relevance uh, of this uh, war on drugs, but take Sustainable Development Goal 16 and its very first target, which was to significantly reduce all forms of violence and related death rates everywhere. Well, hello. Uh, and of course, we're also exhorted to leave no one behind, as I said before. So the Global Commission on Drug Policy would really hope that the next decade uh, on global drug policy would align with the 2030 agenda. And we have uh, produced a whole document on that, which was released at uh, UNGA uh, last September. Uh, also in Mexico, uh, last September, we released the latest report from the Commission on the preferred direction for global drug policy. And it's called Regulation and the Responsible Control of Drugs. Uh, we say that just as societies regulate almost everything else with the potential for harm, whether it's the way we drive our cars, uh, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, guns, food standards, so drugs should be regulated and states should accept their responsibility to uh, do so. So we think it would be really very unfortunate if member states uh, were just to rubber stamp a repeat of this half decade of past global drug policy. We think it would be better to be bold in supporting pragmatic and evidence-informed policies. We've already heard a reference to Switzerland, obviously Portugal, uh, many other examples uh, now where they have had much better results from following different uh, approaches. So we would urge uh, member states uh, to look at the evidence, to look at the other uh, options, to modernise drug policy, to leave no one behind, to aim to reduce the number of deaths and injury, the rate of incarceration, the rate of, of violence, to regulate markets, to try to take uh, criminals uh, out of them, to introduce massive harm reduction policies, which have been shown to work so well uh, in this country, and let's underline to uphold human rights and advance the well-being of the most marginalised people around our world. The 2016 UNGAS was a step forward in the approach to drug policy. I think the real risk now is that the Vienna Ministerial is a step backwards to pre-2016. This would not be progress. So to wind up, the voice of Geneva is very important. How will we end HIV transmission among people who use drugs if there isn't effective harm reduction? This speaks to the UN AIDS mandate. How will we effectively address the pain and suffering of many in our communities without access to essential medication? It's extraordinary how even access to medicinal cannabis is such a controversial issue in many countries. But this issue of access to medication speaks to the WHO mandate. How can we ensure human rights for all when those rights are violated daily around the world in the name of drug control. Uh, this very much speaks to the mandate of the Office of the High Commissioner of, of Human Rights. So from the Global Commission on Drug Policy, we really ask the international Geneva community to join us in advocating for better drug policies which will uphold people's rights and don't marginalise and stigmatise and make things worse for people who use drugs. If we continue to leave those people behind, and there are a great many of them, that is really another blow uh, to prospects of achieving the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Clark. Very enlightening, and that's when you're talking about uh, war on drugs. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been covering the US 
and uh, it was a war on drugs led to a mass incarceration. Even Bill Clinton, who actually put in place this kind of uh, repressive policy, had to come up with apologies a few years ago because he realized the damage that such policy would would uh, or would uh, would do. Now I'm going to hand over the floor to uh, Mariangela Simao. We'll talk about the very health aspect of drug policy. So uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Let me see. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, good. good. I actually should get up because I've been sitting the entire day in the executive boardroom in WGO because we have our, our board this week and last week. But I, I'm going to, so that you can control my time easily. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to come here. It's always a pleasure to come to the Graduate Institute. And actually, the invitation was Dr. Tedros, but he's still there because the, the session is running until 7 tonight. Tomorrow it will be until 8.30. So. But I have, when we were preparing, well, I was preparing for this, uh, framing the, the issue of the public health dimension in, in facts and challenges and a little bit of what we're, and, and there's one fact, you know, in life is that everybody's going to die someday, you know. But the challenge is that people should not die before their time. You know, they should not die when they, it's for preventable reasons. You know, so that's, I think this is a huge challenge for us. I think it's, this is clearly the case of the almost half a, 500, half a billion people who die every year of, of drug-related issues or illnesses like HIV, hepatitis, and so on. You know. The majority of these deaths could be prevented, and quality of life could be improved. And, uh, and this year, last year actually already, because we're in 2019, last year WHO had its 70th anniversary, 70 years, and the Human Rights Council as well. And uh, when the commemoration of the 70th anniversary, Dr. Tedros said that instead of health for all, we have health for few. Right? And this is actually so striking, and some, some people are really affected more by that, you know? Because after all, what we believe in is that everyone, regardless of who they are or where they live, they should have access, at least, to the health services they need when they need it, and, and not go bankrupt because of it, and they should not suffer discrimination. I think this applies very well to, to what we are talking here. And I, we always, I always like to put this, the, when we're talking about drug, the world drug problem, it's like when we are having discussions about intellectual property, right? There's always the, the two sides and it, the, the sides are known, you know, and the, the positions don't change, right? We, we, the world faces a dilemma because on one side, we have the challenge of preventing and treating the harm harmful use of drugs, and, that's a, and the opioid crisis in North America now is, is a good example, if ample evidence of, of harm done by several reasons. On the other side, we have the challenge of ensuring access to drugs with medical use. And here I see Catherine, who will not, yep, you know, I, I need to tick all the boxes because <laughs> on the access to pain medication. You know, the access to pain medication is not a problem from developing world, only it's just more acute in the developing world. This is also present in, in high-income countries where you have only 25% of people who would need pain relief with opioids have access to them. So, so it's, we're talking about something that affects the world. One side you have the, the repression, the other side you have the need for people to have access to, to the technologies that could make a difference. In, in the last decade, the focus of the international agenda was on war on drugs. And increasingly, we, we see in the rhetoric the issues of the, the public health approach come in more frequently. Uh, we know that the war on drugs has failed, and, but I, I, I was thinking about the lost decade, you know? Well, I love the title, it's very impacting. But actually, I think we learned, it's not a lost decade, because we learn what doesn't work, you know? So we should not keep repeating 
what we have evidence that doesn't work. You know, that's uh, we should use the information and the science we have behind it to push everybody, member states and civil society and international organizations for uh, what's the evidence based and what works. So I would say it's not lost, totally lost. And of course we need the, this global agreements to be balanced and to and we need alternative solutions, approaches to, to deal with the world drug problem from a public health and human rights perspective. They come on the same package. The right to health comes on the same package. Um, and some things should be no-brainers because everybody has agreed, I mean, member states, not civil society in this case, has agree, agreed to the Agenda 2030. You know, and there are several, like across the 17 goals, there are 14 goals that have 50 targets that are health-related targets, you know. And we agree to that. The world has agreed to, to this framing on how, how, to, how do we try to make this world a better world. And then we come to the UNGAS outcome document, and then you, you see how, how we think uh, when you're talking about the drug policy, the agreements on drug policy. It's not perfect, but it's better than what we had. Right? That's one thing. But uh, should we be comforted by that? <laughs> no, right? We shouldn't. Uh, it's, but there's a lot of space there that we need to do better. I mean, we collectively. Because it's better than the other frameworks we had before. And uh, it, it gives a more space for human rights and, and health. So how do we take advantage of that? On the WHO side, we, many of you know, and I, I see some people here who are also on, on the board meeting, we know that, you know that WHO has approved a strategy last year, and uh, one of the three pillars is serve the vulnerable, protect health, uh, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. So the commitment to address the health needs of people who use drugs through services to less discrimination, so this is part of what we do, right? WHO has some core normative functions that affect this discussion. One of them, of course, is the Expert Committee on Drug Dependence. That's a hardcore. Uh, we, we also have the Essential Medicines List, and this is, this is another good, good, part of the normative whole, and we do the guidelines development. You know? And here, the other box that I need always to tick, that's part of my background, because I, I come from the HIV world more recently. Harm reduction works, and WHO has guidelines on harm reduction. Right? And, you know, so there's some things that you need to think. And also, the. The fact that we, the, I mentioned already on the, the, the pain relief, I think we have a crisis that's a, it's a, it's a humanitarian crisis, you know, because people should not die in suffering. Finally, just to paraphrase in my boss, you know, he said when, I think it was one of these Geneva dialogues, the world drug problem is not a, an either or issue. It's not a zero-sum game. And then, I like that, because before I joined WHO, I used to work for, in, uh, first for UNAIDS, and before that, I used to work for the Brazilian government. And when I, when I, I came to Geneva for WJ and so on, I had a, this Brazilian friend who used to work for WHO, and when I was pushing, pushing, he, will, he used to say, you know, WHO moves at glacial speed. No, but then, global warming came, and, we should we have to move faster, right? I think we got used to incremental steps in the drug policy, you know, and we need to make do our best. And if we can use the health, the right to health, and the health health is usually a very concrete area to work with. You can measure if we can use that to leverage beyond incremental steps. Maybe we can get somewhere. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your insightful intervention thank you very much it resonates pretty much here in geneva in switzerland since
Ms. Ruth Dreyfus is here, chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. She was pretty much involved as health minister. She was president of Switzerland, but she was also health minister, very much involved in putting in place this uh, uh, four-pillar uh, drug policy, which focused also on, uh, on improving the health of drug users, for example. So thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to Anne Fordham, the Executive Director of International Drug Policy. Policy uh, Consortium. She's going to give us the main takeaways from this so-called shadow report, uh, which is a scientific approach of what has been done and what has succeeded in the last 10 years. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Stefan, and for the kind introduction. Um, yes, Ambassador Zellweger, dear commissioners, esteemed fellow panelists, dear colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here in Geneva as part of this special event. Thank you so much to the Graduate Institute for, for hosting us and to our co-host, the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Thank heavens for the Global Commission on Drug Policy. I think that's what civil society would like to say <laughs> in response. Always giving space to civil society, always pushing the debate and, and really taking this, this discussion forward in a very productive and empowering impactful way. Um, thank you also to Leton for um, moderating today. It is really important, as I think um, previous speakers have said, that we're having this discussion here in Geneva, the Geneva mandates on health and human rights and their intersect with drug control are so fundamentally um, important and the Geneva voice needs to be heard in the debate. It's also the seat of the global HIV response and we know that draconian and repressive drug policies have hampered the HIV response and hepatitis C for people who inject drugs. So it's really, really great to be here and also to encourage the Geneva mandates to continue to engage in this important debate. The recent UNGAS on drugs was already mentioned, and in the UNGAS process, we saw other UN entities coming to the table, kind of breaking what we call the Vienna monopoly. Um, and of course, UNODC has the lead, but other UN agencies have a place at the table and have a mandate that needs to be heard as well. So I really want to continue to encourage and support that. We really value the opportunity to bring our report here, um, Taking Stock, a Decade of Drug Policies. We have launched the report already in Geneva and also in New York. So it's great also to be able to bring it here to Geneva. As has already been mentioned, we're at a critical juncture in the international drug policy debate. The last Global Action Plan on Drugs, which was a 10-year plan, has just come to an end. And as Commissioner Clark has already mentioned, there was no formal evaluation by the relevant UN agencies or any member states of the last 10 years. And for us, we feel that it's very important if we are to consider what comes next, which is what they're discussing in Vienna at the moment, ahead of the ministerial segment in March, where in theory well, they will define the next phase of international drug policy. They really need to take stock of what happened over the last 10 years against the goals that were set in 2009. The drug market has changed dramatically in 10 years. It's become more complex. There have been changing patterns of trafficking and production, the rise of online markets, new types of drugs. The division between production, trafficking, and consumption countries has also become increasingly blurred. And in the meantime, there have actually been, going back to the comment about the lost decade, some positive developments you know, in, in national um, policies. So those also need to be taken into consideration, but also there's been some very problematic backsliding. So we appreciate that the issue of how to manage drugs is complex, and with this report, we're seeking to put the evidence and the data on the table for the consideration of member states as they think about this next phase of international drug policy. In formulating social and public policy, and I think that's Switzerland is such a leading example of this. It is fundamental to consider the impact on the lives and communities of people um, and on public health and human rights, which is both at the core of the values of the United Nations. So that's why we chose to draft this um, shadow report. I'm just going to show you some brief slides which really picks up the, 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 some of the key data points, really, in, in my short time that I have. Um, 
we, we basically looked at um, the data that was available between 2009 and 2016 to look at whether there had been progress against the goals set in 2009 to significantly reduce or eliminate the global drug market. But in parallel, we also wanted to look at whether and how the last 10 years striving to implement these goals had contributed to the broader priorities of the UN, namely of protecting human rights, of advancing peace and security, of protecting health and promoting development. And we also offer some recommendations for the next decade in drug policy, focusing on the UNGAS outcomes and the sustainable development goals. So let me just move on to the first slide. So progress made. Um, against the drug-free targets. Target one seeks to reduce or eliminate the cultivation of certain plants. And I think as, as Commissioner Clark already outlined, data sh from the UNODC shows us there's been a massive increase in opium production and coca cultivation, which are now at record level levels. On target two, which seeks to reduce both illicit demand as well as the health and social risks, we note an average of a 31% increase in the number of people who use drugs. Um, with reducing health and social risks very relevant here in Geneva, we have not seen a reduction in HIV, Hep C, and TB prevalence amongst people who use drugs. Overall infection rates have remained stable and in some regions are increasing. There's been a worrying increase in drug-related deaths. That is a really shocking figure from 2015. And this equates to around 50 deaths an hour. Um, one third to a half of these deaths are from preventable overdose. The rest are from complications from HIV, Hep C, and TB. On target three, which seeks to reduce the availability of um, drugs, including synthetic drugs, there's been a huge um, increase Oh, sorry, I think I've removed that slide, but a huge increase in, in the number of new psychoactive substances on the market and expanding markets for methamphetamine um, around the world. Target four in the political declaration seeks to eliminate and reduce the diversion and trafficking of precursors. And despite the best e efforts of member states, we know that there's been an increase in the precursor market as well. And target five seeks to eliminate or reduce money laundering. And again, despite tighter controls, estimates are that less than 1% of all money being laundered is currently being seized. Um, on access to controlled medicines, very relevant here, although I think WHO is doing laudable work here, 75% of the world's population remain without access to proper pain relief, still at this stage. Um, also on other human rights impacts, and um, this has already been mentioned, but... Um, Sorry, I just lost track of my slides there. But you can see there, you know, we still have an unmitigated human rights disaster going on in the name of drug control around the world. Numbers of extrajudicial killings, that's really coming from the Philippines over the last three years alone, some 27,000 unlawful killings there in the name of the war on drugs. One in five people incarcerated worldwide is for a drug offense. And in many parts of the world, um, women are the fastest growing prison population, mainly for drug offenses. So it's incredibly worrying. We still face a lot of torture and cruel and inhumane punishment for people who use drugs, particularly in parts of Southeast Asia. And in impacts on peace and security, instead of reducing the overall scale of the illegal drug market, overly punitive policies have tend to exacerbate violence, instability, and corruption. And I mentioned earlier the, the growth of online markets. Interdiction efforts on online markets have really failed to reduce the, the growth of these markets. Um, and and they, they are only growing despite how much effort is, is put into trying to shut them down. So really, we are at this important stage in formulating the next phase of policy. And as the International Drug Policy Consortium, we're really calling on member states to honestly consider the progress or lack thereof that has been made towards the overarching goals they set themselves 10 years ago. We also think that the UNGAS outcome document does represent a step forward, and the implementation of the UNGAS outcome document should be the focus for the coming period, whether that's 10 years. And as our shadow report clearly states, it is impossible to credibly claim any progress towards the goals they set, even though there's some discussion of restating those goals now in Vienna. 
given the reality of a very robust and growing illicit drug market. So it's time to change course, as Commissioner Clark said, and it's time that the international community moves away from those damaging and unrealistic drug-free goals and targets and considers what more meaningful <laughs> objectives of, illicit, of, the, of trying to um, well, not even trying to reduce the illicit drug market, I think, but what more meaningful goals and targets would be that would prioritize health, well-being, and human rights. And as I mentioned, Geneva has a really critical role to play. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think the report Anne Fordham just presented shows the importance of uh, civil society in issues like this. I think it's great that you... Uh, such a report could come out and, you know, to comment on what Helen Clark in the report calls a vacuum. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, and you, very impressive presentation. I know you got up very early this morning, so thank you so much for this. Now I would like to uh, hand the floor to uh, Mohamed Mahmoud Oud Mohamedou, professor here at the Graduate Institute, is, is going to give us a perspective from uh, West Africa, and uh, your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Madam President, uh, Ambassador Zellweger, Director Burin, I'm very happy to, to share some thoughts uh, ever so briefly on, on two things. I'll say a few things about the topic itself essentially echoing what my colleagues have been saying in relation to the report and what's been published, importantly on this, uh, and sharing um, some um, information about a, um, an initiative that was started a few years back by the late Kofi Annan, in which I'm a, of which I'm a member, which I think is not known enough, unfortunately, even amongst professionals working on this, which is the West African uh, Commission on Drugs. So. Um, the first set of comments, I think, on, on what we've heard and on the problem, which I think is, is really important to, to highlight conceptually, if one could say so, in terms of the global perspective of this problem, and we've heard this a lot, and the notion that there is clearly a moment now, historically, where we can take stock of what's been lost, although I do share the, the thought that um, in such loss we also have learned what uh, does not work, and that is a lesson that is an important one. But there's a layered aspect to this, which works at the local level, we'll hear about this, at the national, at the regional, at the international level. And I think this is also a reflection of the fact that many of these things today are functioning in this so-called transversal or transnational way. We see how some of these drug traffickers function across spaces and in their networks. And we see also how much of these policy dynamics function equally transversally. So there's something there that cuts both ways if we navigate that properly in terms of how to present a policy consensus, which should be beyond Vienna and Geneva, I feel like saying. There's a world that is far beyond that. So yes, that link needs to be made, but it is also Vienna, Geneva, and the rest of the world, certainly onto the region that I was, uh, will address in a moment. My second point uh, is about this notion, not so much of last decade, but the concept of the war itself. And I think there's a large consensus among professionals working at this, that this is the wrong term, the war on terror. But thinking about it coming here earlier this afternoon, it seems to me that seldom has such a concept been unfortunately branded so successfully uh, since the early 1970s when the Nixon administration uses it in effect in a very delegitimizing ways against African Americans in urban uh, sectors and ghettos all the way to the connections with the Latin American interventionism. There's a moment there where this concept is associated fundamentally with a pretty nasty set of histories. And I think that we need to have this concept which is about essentially a martial terminology to eradicate, to, to, to go to war against something which I think could and has been addressed differently, a struggle against, or merely a campaign to end. The global um, um, initiative that Mrs. Uh, Dreyfus leads uses very helpfully other types of terminology. If you go through their reports, they speak of control, of a problem, 
quote, of reform. And I think these are the kinds of terms that we've been lo looking at. There is a perception issue. In fact, they have a report precisely on this notion of a perception issue. So I think this is a, a, an important element, and we have to find a way to have some sort of rupture vis-a-vis -vis this type of terminology, because there's a way of addressing the problem and even ending it without necessarily having this combating aspect that has been militarized, by the way, also in recent years. So in 2012, um, the late Kofi Annan very helpfully uh, gathered a group of 10 commissioners uh, from West Africa, from a variety of, of uh, broads of life, uh, from the arts, from academia, from policy making. And he invited us to reflect and work on this issue. And we had a, a very intensive and successful cooperation with the Global Commission. And I'd like to recognize here the important work that Mrs. Dreyfus did in attending our meetings in Accra and taking part all the way to recent meetings in Dakar. So many thanks for that on behalf of the Commission. And, um, and and frankly, this has been a very successful initiative. There's a fantastic report out there on the website of the WACD, which I highly recommend you read. We started from the point of view that there is an issue, of a, 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 a three-tiered problem in the West African slash Sahel region. The transshipment that comes across the region that is relatively familiar to many, the notion of consumption, which is of course global, but here uh, echoed locally, and the effect, importantly for us, on uh, policy making essentially on development, um, uh, on essentially the impact on state building. As we went through that, we found out about something I don't think we expected, which is that there's also a production problem, small level production, particularly in terms of synthetic drugs uh, that in, in parts of, of uh, particularly Ghana and Nigeria, where that came across, uh, interestingly, as an additional dimension. So the report highlights um, a couple of things, such as the role of this problem undermining the development of institutions, Obviously, the fact that it is threatening and is a public health issue itself, as I think there is consensus among the people that think about this in the region from the right perspective, the civil society perspective, and, and some government authorities, I should say. Um, and most importantly, that it is standing in the way of development efforts, this kind of meta level that we tend to forget sometimes, particularly uh, in, indeed in Geneva and in, in, um, in uh, Vienna. Um, there is a dimension, and this will be something of interest to you, Mr. Bussa, which is about the conflicts in the regions, of course, that have materialized in recent years, the degree and levels of stateness that is impacted by this, and also the notion of corruption of the justice system, uh, where this is clearly uh, an element there. So we discuss uh, in those efforts the role, the problematic role of the upgraded capabilities of the drug traffickers. This is also something that we need to take into account as we look into this. It is not a static scene. You see these actors as increasingly becoming much more self-empowered, much more canny, much more able to travel and 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 impact the scenes in uh, in a criminalized way, obviously, uh, but in much more professional, quote-unquote, way. So how to address that? The report goes into at length about, obviously, investing in treatment. I think this echoes everything we've heard. Uh, the importance of developing standards to assess that and to have systems of monitoring, which are also missing, obviously, because of the development capabilities. All in all, it came across quite clearly in that effort that this is a public health issue with socioeconomic causes at its heart, rather than a criminal justice matter. Uh, the work has luckily continued, and in September of this year in Dakar, in presence of Mrs. Dreyfus, again, thank you, there was a very interesting and important follow-up to this uh, on which I will end, which I wanted to bring to you as an actual tool for policy making, which is that rather than leaving the report as what it is, as I said, insightful, important, uh, a repository of information, what the second phase of the project was, was to develop a so-called model drug law for West Africa, that on the basis of this element of need for standards, a template of sorts was developed with civil society, with the involvement of the Global Commission, as I said, uh, and other actors. Um, and this was launched in uh, Dakar, but there was also an event in Burkina Faso uh, that followed what was the purpose of that specifically was to present an actual template, a policy, actually a tool for policy makers, which is the subtitle of the document, so that they could go to that and use it. And the document presents the standards and it has a component for each one of these sections as a legal commentary. It is essentially a legal tool to work with that. So the legal framework functions in a way that highlights all of these aspects that are important 
I think internationally, as, as we've heard, but regionally to have it work in sync. I think fundamentally the, the, the one ID that I would like to stress is not only that it is a comprehensive issue, that it is a public health issue rather than a criminal one or even a militarized one as I mentioned earlier, but one that if we find, if we are able to strike the right alignment between local, regional, national, regional, international, I think we will have much more tools to make the next decade, I think, more successful in that sense. Um, and I think there's important work being done, the report that we've just heard Mrs. Fulham summarizing, but also these regional um, initiatives, this is one, there are many others, but I certainly invite everyone here and other professionals to look at the, the work being done uh, and also paying memory to the late Kofi Annan. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think you, you did highlight the very challenges of drug policies by underlining all the dimensions of the problem, and which uh, Anne before did as well, by underlining the fact that the drug market is getting, getting more and more complex. But before opening the, uh, the floor to the, the audience for some questions and to, to the uh, closing remarks from by Ruth Dreyfus, I would like to hand over to uh, Anna Sarang. She is the uh, president of the Andre Rilke Foundation. She's going to give us uh, the community perspective. And we would be very happy if you could say maybe a, a few words about Andre Rilke, whom we don't necessarily know. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak here and share my perspective uh, from Russia on this problem. It's a huge honor for me to be in the room with uh, some of my heroes. And uh, I'm really happy that I can um, talk a little bit about the past decade as it happened in Russia. And I, as I was asked to speak on behalf of the communities, I guess I cannot talk on behalf of all the communities affected by the war on drugs, but I can talk about uh, women from Russia who use drugs, I do use drugs, illicit drugs myself. Uh, sorry, mom, but <laughs> I, I never developed drug dependency. I don't have HIV. I don't have hepatitis C. I've never been in prison. So I don't really bear the same stigma and the same weight of discrimination as other women who use drugs in my country. However, I did work for the past 20 years in the field of drug policy, HIV prevention, and harm reduction in Moscow, in Russia, the country with one of the most repressive policies, drug policies in the world. Uh, during, uh, Russia is uh, very adherent to the 2009 political declaration on drugs and Russia really strictly implements some of the provisions of this uh, declaration. Russia's drug, national drug policy, drug strategy is based on, the, on this declaration. However, this national drug strategy does not even mention one's human rights. It poses harm reduction and opioid substitution treatment as threat to the national drug policy. And this drug strategy is based on zero tolerance towards people who use drugs. As a result of this drug policy in the last decade, as a person who works in this field, I have witnessed a huge degradation in the field of health and human rights for people who use drugs. We are now among three top countries with increasing level of HIV epidemic. We have over 1 million people living with HIV by the official data. We're among three countries in the world with a huge, with the most, uh, with the highest level of multidrug resistant tuberculosis due to, to huge level of incarceration. We have estimated 5 million people living with hepatitis C, and we have a huge um, prison population which consists mostly of people who are incarcerated for nonviolent uh, drug offenses. I wanted to share a personal story with you just to give a kind of personal touch and human face to our discussion. And uh, it's not my story, it's a story of my fellow activists. 
uh, from a woman uh, from Russia, the city called Talyati, and her name is Oksana Shpagina. Her story actually started also about 10 years ago when she already had developed drug dependency with heroin dependency, she had HIV, but 10 years ago she decided to try to give up drugs because she really wanted to have a healthy life and she wanted to have a baby. Two years later, she met a person she fell in love with and she got pregnant. She was so happy about it. She was still not using drugs. However, the doctors told her that because she had HIV, she could not, and because she used to be a junkie, she could not have a normal baby. She was told that she will give a birth to a cripple, to an ugly child, that she is not deserving to have a baby herself because of her horrible life before that. She really struggled with the doctors. However, she decided to have an abortion because she was threatened so much and she started to believe herself that having HIV is a contradiction to having a baby. However, uh, when she already was ready to terminate her pregnancy, uh, I forgot to also mention that because of all the stress that she went through, she started to use drugs again while she was pregnant. Uh, and uh, she could not get any drug treatment. As I mentioned before, substitution treatment is illegal in Russia, is considered as a, as a threat to the national drug strategy, but it's the only way to keep a pregnant woman in drug treatment and in Russia women are deprived of this uh, treatment. So she found out from her friends that actually people with HIV, women with HIV can give birth to healthy babies and she decided to have a baby. And although she was under stress for all the term of her pregnancy, she had a healthy baby. Uh, the baby was a bit earlier, but she had a healthy daughter and she was so happy about it. However, she kept meeting all the threats that the baby will be taken away from her. She was so stressed and she, was, uh, she kept using drugs. Several, several years later, Oksana decided to undergo a drug rehabilitation. She couldn't get access to proper drug treatment or assistance, so she went to a rehabilitation center. Uh, based on like some faith-based center. Unfortunately, it was not very successful. And uh, after a couple of months, she started to use drugs again. Later, police came to her house and she was arrested for drug possession. Uh, she was released that time, but several months later, the police came again and they planted drugs to her house. And uh, she was in prison for, she was given three years term uh, in a Russian colony. We actually interviewed her two years ago for the report of the Global Commission on Drug Policy 2017. From prison, she shared her story and she said that it was so unfair that she was in prison she was not involved in drug trafficking. She was just a drug user. In prison, she didn't get proper medication for her HIV condition. The antiretroviral medication was intermittent and the quality of treatment was very poor. She also didn't have a chance to be with her baby, obviously. She was released from prison uh, less than one year ago, but uh, 18 days ago she has died because of the poor treatment um, with antiretrovirals in prison and because it's a very common story for our friends in Russia who have HIV, who get the prison term, which can be a death sentence for them. I'm really sorry for my emotions. It just happened uh, recently. And uh, I wanted to share the story because Oksana is a victim of the war on drugs. 
but also because her story is a story of resistance. As I mentioned, she was an activist. Through all these years, when she struggled with her drug dependency, when she struggled with discrimination, when she struggled with humiliation, she never failed to fight for her dignity. In 2013, for the first time, she issued a complaint to the UN Special Rapporteur on the violence against women and to the UN Special Rapporteur on health. Her complaint has been accepted and communicated to Russia. However, Russia said that they don't find any violations of human rights in Oksana's story. She has given several press conferences in her city, despite the fear and despite the oppression and despite the constant threat from the doctors, from the police. She was brave enough to share her story. We also, uh, Oksana has also issued a complaint to the UN Committee against all forms of discrimination against women and her case is now under review of the committee. To me, she is not a victim of the war on drugs. She is a real hero, the hero who could speak up despite all the terrible things that she has faced. But to me, Oksana also is a, although she is a hero, she is a typical unfortunately very typical example of what is happening with women in our country. Unfortunately, Russia is not accountable. As you can see from the response to the special rapporteurs, as you can see to any official communication of the uh, Russian government to our multiple complaints about discrimination of people who, who use drugs, Russia cannot be held accountable. But why? Because Russia always justifies its action with adherence to the UN drug declarations. And uh, the Russian government is proud to have this restrictive and repressive drug policy. Thank you, Thank you so much for, for your... Yes, I just wanted to say that I think that it's really gra great that this report has come out and I hope it can strengthen our voice when we talk to the UN human rights bodies in Geneva. I think it's very important that these bodies start to uh, listen and implement human rights guidelines in the field of drug policy and in relation to people who have died during this past decade of this war on drugs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your this very touching testimony and putting a face on a very, very problem. Thank you very much indeed. I would like now to open the floor uh, to questions. So if you can identify yourself, ask a brief question so that we can have as many questions as possible. Mr. Right here. Uh, thank you, Richard Hill, a private citizen uh, troublemaker. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. I thought they were all excellent and very poignant. Thank you very much. But I'd like to push the envelope a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to make two comments. The first is, uh, it's always puzzled me about this incredible hypocritical dichotomy between what we know to be the most widely used and most dangerous psychoactive substance, which I was just abusing a couple of hours ago, which is alcohol, as opposed to everything else. You know, and we just have to get over this. If alcohol is good and allowed, why is marijuana, which is much less harmful, something evil? And my second comment is, some of us here are old enough to know Dr. Thomas Zsaj. Anybody remember him? A Hungarian uh, psychiatrist uh, in the US. And he was making the point that, you know, everybody is free to poison themselves by anything they want. And much of this, I don't know if he said that, this is my thought, much of this psychosis about 
uh, illicit substances comes from this religious idea, in some religions, not all, that there's something wrong with pleasure. Now, we've gotten over that for sex, right? Nowadays, in much of the world, we don't have a problem with sex for pleasure. So why don't we get over it for drugs? So-called drugs, right? Why is it that if I get stone drunk, the only person who's bothered by it is my wife, whereas if I just get plain stoned, sorry for the colloquialism, I might go to jail? And, you know, you've hinted at that, but really we have to tackle this head on. There's some fundamental problem here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who, who wants to answer the question? Uh, Ellen Clark, please. It's on? Yes. Yeah. No, there, there is a fundamental problem because the classification of drugs bears no relationship whatsoever to their potential for harm. And I think the sort of consensus is that if you're looking at potential for problematic harm, uh, for cannabis it comes in at about 9%, for alcohol 15 heroin 23 and tobacco over 30 <laughs> Now, you know, w which is legal and which is illegal, you know, the most dangerous, arguably, uh, is tobacco. And in my past as a Minister of Health, I would often uh, say that tobacco is more addictive and dependence-creating than morphine or heroin. So, you know, go, go figure. So it, it's the hypocrisy around the classification that I think we, we, need, we need to expose. I understand that WHO is really looking at the classification of cannabis, and I, I hope that uh, some common sense might come out of that. Thank you. Further question? Thank you. Uh, my name is Famsi Tashim Obale Yusuf. I'm from Nigeria. I flew in for the interest I have on this. And I thank all the presenters for this wonderful presentations. Mine, I came from a regulatory background. I retired from government as head of narcotics control in Nigeria. And I was the chairman of the Equas Medicines and Counterfeit Task Force. I have been gallivanting between Vienna and Geneva, driving the policies in my country. But I'm worried worried in terms of carrying the outcomes and putting them in practical perspective, especially in least developed countries, and also where the economy is weak. Whenever I get back home and present the discussions from Geneva and Vienna, it may stay on the table and it may not go beyond the presentation. And that's the worry. If you run across today, is a rise in MPS. Today in Nigeria, codeine and codeine derivatives, tramadol are the lead killer medicines because of the rise in poverty and lack of work. So, could you what ask do your we, what do we, question, please? Yes, my question is that the disparity must be bridged. How do we do that? Do we need to build capacity? Do we need to build stronger international collaboration in dealing with this and make it practical? Where do we start from? Thank you. Who wants to answer? Please. I'm happy to take it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comment. I think, I think you, you, the answer to your question is, is in your comment. I think that there's different things in, in different ways of approaching the problem, but I think you put your finger on two things. One, on the one hand, there is the, an understanding of the problem, and we just had a first layer here in terms of, of criminalizing something that does not necessarily need to be criminalized and treated as a health issue. And if we are able to have enough of an international consensus policy construct, some, some sort of architecture that gives something that could be then implemented more linearly, I think that would be already progress. We're not there yet. I think this is the, 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 the status quo as of today. So that's missing. But your, I also read in what you said something we encountered in the experience that I mentioned in going through the region, which is that we came across a lot of specialists, a lot of doctors, a lot of, of, of policy makers, a lot of civil society activists that were fully 
in, in a sophisticated ways, understanding the problem, what's needed, but we're frustrated by what you pointed out, namely the institutional weakness in and around that. And that is conflating it with the other problem, which is the ability to implement that with viable institutions, structures, justice systems, as I mentioned. Um, and I think that's, that's two different aspects of the problem, but they are related in, in the way that you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, yes. Hello, my name is Sylvia Paul. I work in ITU. Um, I was born in Nicaragua, grew up in Costa Rica, and traveled extensively before coming to Geneva uh, in Central America. So I've seen the problems related to drug trafficking and organized crime in Central America, and sometimes firsthand through friends who have suffered have had a family member killed because of organized crime, have uh, a family extorted because of a gang who is involved in organized crime. And one issue, I know the importance that you have discussed on the matter related to this having to uh, shift the focus to being at the public health issue. But uh, I think Ms. Mrs. Clark touched a bit on it, on the linkage with the SDGs, because this is not only a public health issue. In Central America, it's a poverty issue. It's a lack of education issue. It's a lack of jobs issue. We recently saw the caravan, those hundreds and hundreds of people who wanted to walk from Honduras to, to the border with the US and many were fleeing drug-related violence and gangs. And this, that part, has, I, I feel, has not been discussed today and has not been really approached today. And I also wanted to go specifically where, ask why, and also ask Anne, because I know you couldn't, sh Anne, Ms. Anne Fordham, I know you couldn't show the whole study, but you talked about drug-related death. But I, if I understood correctly, the 450,000 were more linked to overdose and what you say is uh, AIDS related. But what about the deaths related to drug and organized crime violence? Uh, I know the OECD, has, the, sorry, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime has a, a the homicide index. And sadly, cities in, in Central America, Honduras, in Guatemala, in, in, in El Salvador, are in the top 10 of those cities mostly related to drug trafficking. And the sad part is most of those countries, we don't produce it and we don't mainly consume it. Thank you. We're yeah. in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask more why that part has not been Thank discussed. You. Who wants to, to answer to this very specific uh, issue of Central America with a very uh, vibrant uh, testimony? Well, when we uh, met as a global commission in Mexico, we had former President Cedillo uh, with us, and he and colleagues have produced a brilliant paper on the impact of the war on drugs in Mexico. You know, before 2006, when President Calderon launched the stepped up and militarized campaign, Mexico was not a homicide capital of the world. Uh, all that changed when that pressure uh, came on. And I know the new president now is looking at you know, ways that they can wind back from that. It's not going to be easy. But the reality is that once you criminalise something that there's a market for, <laughs> that market's going to be controlled by criminals with all the implications that we've seen in, in, in Central America. And I referred to Mexico having now seen a quarter of a million deaths in the so-called war on drugs. The hundreds of thousands have internally displaced, the 30,000 disappeared, almost certainly dead, and, and so on. So, so we need, why, why we advocate decriminalisation and effective regulation is to actually get this out of the hands of, of, of criminals. Interestingly, we learned when in Mexico uh, that now with the legal cannabis markets opening up in the United States and also even more states uh, legislating for medicinal cannabis, uh, the demand for illicit product from Mexico has gone down. But you know there may also be the opportunity in the future for small farmers to supply legal markets. 
But uh, this extent now of, of, of legalisation and regulation in the US is also changing the dynamics of the criminal market. They may change to something else. Who knows what it will be? Fake pharmaceuticals, as our colleague from Nigeria just mentioned, is a very fast-growing criminal market and, and killing people in, in your part of the world. Uh, but we could get this trade out of the hands of, of, of criminals if we take the approach the Global Commission is recommending. Thank you. Anne? Yeah, I just wanted to respond. We do address that point also in the report. I, I didn't highlight it today. Um, and I encourage you to look at that part. I think the other thing to say is that it is definitely a big part of the, of the drug control debate. And we mentioned the UN General Assembly special session in 2016. Actually, that special session could really have been happening in, now in 2019, but it was brought forward by three years because Latin American governments led by Colombia, Mexico and Guatemala called for that moment to be brought forward because they felt that a discussion on drug control policies was urgently needed based on the fact that they were facing such unprecedented levels of violence in the hemisphere and that they needed to address that discussion. And also that call was um, linked to uh, um, an initiative taken by the Organization of American States where they did a scenarios mapping process of different four different scenarios on how drug policies could develop to address the issue of violence and insecurity in particular. And again, I think as, um, as Commissioner Clark has pointed out, actually one of the recommendations was to look at legally regulated markets. Because at the end of the day, you know, organized crime will always be taking advantage of ways to increase their profits. And the illegality of drugs currently has a huge profit margin for them. And the violence to some extent, and definitely in Mexico has been mentioned, has been driven by the government response to the cartels. So, you know, violence begets violence. And I think that's escalated. It's, you know, tricky to, to see in Mexico how that will, will scale back. But of course, yeah, the, the, the issue I think of, of legal regulation is something that is increasingly on the table. Um, and as, as we know, has started already for, for cannabis um, at this stage. Thank you so much. Thank, and thank you for the panel for coming up with all those, for tackling all the, those issues linked to drug policy. Now I would like to hand the floor to the former president of Switzerland, uh, Ruth Jeffries. She's the chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy and was also health minister, and she's going to come up with closing remarks. Thank you, Ms. Jeffries. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, I think it was a, a very important picture that was given about the broad uh, problems linked with uh, drug and uh, drug policy, failed drug policy. I thank you so much. Uh, um, your contribution was a contribution to highlight, really, the situation in which we are. So it is not a shadow uh, report. It is a highlighting report. And it's the only real report that gives the situation now in the broad uh, view of uh, what we uh, face. Uh, it's a pity. It's a pity that this was not done by the governments, that this was not done by the UN system as a such in, uh, in the whole uh, uh, spectrum of uh, the aspect. Some international organization gave their contribution, put the accent of their field of activities, and this was a first step to break the silo thinking inside the UN system. Helen, when she was administrator of the UNDP, made the first real report to animate the discussion in Vienna and in the other uh, places and in the, in the, country, in the, in the States uh, to show the aspect of development the High Commissioner for Human Rights did the same and showed the aspect of human rights violation in this policy. WHO, thank you uh, uh, for showing in which field also WHO is uh, bringing his voice, uh, its voice, I think, um, to, to bring really also the picture of public health, of lack of access to medicine and so on.
Uh, UNAIDS is very active also because the link between uh, eight, uh, the pandemic and the drug policy is great. But what we need is really to bring all this together and the report is doing, uh, is doing that. But the report is more of that. It is a call for a policy that is evidence-based, citizen-based, and accountable uh, for uh, the people in the sense that uh, what we need is really a change in the way we deal with complex uh, problem. And I am very thankful also uh, for the remark on the war on drugs. I mean, it's silly. When you declare a war, you have to say who is the enemy and when the war will be finished. What will be the victory? You made the, par the parallel with the war on terror, and it's the same thing. I mean, you, you declare a war, and declaring the war, you made millions of people, or thousands of people, or hundreds of thousands of people, the enemies. The war on drugs is a war on people. It's not a war on substance. You cannot kill a substance. You can kill people. So this is a very important point of uh, reflection I think we need. From my experience, policy has to be accountable. That means that you have to say what you intend to do, how you intend to do it, and if what, you, what was your aim can be achieved and was achieved. And we have this uh, difficult situation in the drug policy that we are not ready on the international level to make these steps. We are not ready to have a real accountability. The lack of, a, of a assessment for the 10 years is a proof of that. We don't have a real uh, wish to, co to, to, to listen to the needs of the people because uh, when we uh, see the different uh, and I think the Russian example is such a moving but such a, a terrible example of not listening to the need of the people, letting them die, letting them be, uh, become uh, ill, letting them uh, contract uh, tuberculosis, let, the, let Russia be a threat also for the health of the continent. And uh, uh, the, we, we still are in a situation where drug policy on the international level is ideologically uh, inspired and not evidence inspired. And our fight should be to look all this aspect with a rational and pragmatic uh, way. That means that we have to integrate all the elements. We have to integrate also the power of the criminal organization and not put just our hands in, in our pockets and abandon uh, a whole economic field to their power. But we have also to collaborate against this organization because they are not only interested in drugs. They are businesses who can make money with very different things. We can take them a large part of the drug, um, of the drug uh, field, of the drug activities, and control them in a way that is accountable, that is responsible, and in a way that should be evidence-based. The example we had about uh, the risk linked with different substances has no real basis. It, uh, it becomes now, with the help of WHO, to uh, open a discussion about cannabis. For those who do not know, in the convention, cannabis is considered as dangerous as uh, heroin and cocaine, and even denying every, any medical use. And we see in the praxis that uh, this is not uh, the case and that uh, uh, the scheduling of these different substances should be based on science and not on uh, ideology and not on the idea that if a minority that is uh, marginalized 
minority is suspected to introduce a new substance in an old culture, this substance is terrible, but the substance in the old culture is good as the example of alcohol uh, was uh, raised by one of the remarks. So we are here, I think, to advocate for responsible policy based on science, but based also on a dialogue with the people who are uh, the most at risk. And uh, we think that the UN system needs really to tackle with this issue in this way, because we are in a time where multilateralism is in discussion. Multilateralism is uh, very important, but it has to focus really on the real problem, not to be inspired by ideology, but be inspired by the real wish to collaborate to solve the problem. And this is uh, the reason why I'm so thankful for the report, so thankful for the NGOs, uh, and we will continue to work with the authorities on one side, with the UN agency on the other side, with the uh, people who are really uh, the people who are uh, dealing with the problem at the ground, because we need all this coalition to be uh, able to progress. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for all of you in the panel. We are really a coalition for the best uh, policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dreyfus. And uh, I would like to thank, uh, yeah, a big applause for the whole panel because it was a great conversation. Thank you.